noticed that there's hundreds of thousands of Christians being persecuted around this world. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands are losing their lives. It is, a, it is another great holocaust that's went unnoticed mm -hmm. and it's still continuing to this day. And we just need to thank God we're living in a nation just now which I believe is fast turning from the security that we once um, had. Can we please just, I've just got down here, let's please can just hold up Charles and Suzanne and our prayers as well. A lot of pressure on them just now and, and the whole work in Balmaha and the work that they are busy with. And, um, you know, let us just pray for this brother and sister. It's a precious brother and sister and part of this fellowship. And I just want you just to, just to focus upon them and just pray that God does a, ma a major Amen. work in their lives and Amen. in the business Amen. dynamics and all the pressures that all of that brings. So can I just flag that up for you? I hope they don't mind me bringing that to your attention. <clears throat> but let's just hold our brother and sister up in our prayers. We're blessed to been with them yesterday as well. It's a good time. Just a fellowship being out together, guys, wasn't it? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Uh, if I was going to tell this, I would call it the walls, the walls, and hopefully that will probably um, explain itself as we go through the service. Fortresses I've got down here were walled cities that protected the inhabitants against their enemies. It was a means of defence in which you could control who came in, but also who went out. They were very relevant in times past. When there was lots of marauders that could just appear on your borders at any given time. And the only way you could protect yourself was when you had a fortress, a walled city, if you like. People could go into it, we could shut the gates and fortify it. And you used to try and make it as secure as you could be. So walls are very, very important today. We've got these beautiful walls here at Eastgate as well. A lot of time and effort. And um, they mean more to me than probably most. And um, but thank the Lord for them. We think of the Great Wall of China, that's probably the greatest wall in the world. And um, never had the privilege of going there. I was going to, quote, I was going to say a wee funny there. I said, one time I was in China, I just went for a run and ran along the top of the wall. But um, that wall apparently is just 21,200 kilometres long. So they say, I Googled that fact. I never counted it as I ran, you know, as I did the miles. And of course, they built that to what? To keep marauders out, to protect them as, as, as a country, as a nation. But also it meant they could control things. When you've got a wall, it means you've got control. So you can control what comes in, what comes out. You get gates, usually. Places you have to pass through. So it's a way of not only protection, but of controlling. Keeps, keeps not only those people out, but it also can keep people in. <clears throat> and uh, maybe one day I'll get to China and, and I'll walk along that wall. I'll, I'll look part of it anyway. And just to, just to tick the box. We have also, in our own land here as well, we've got Hadrian's Wall, or we've got the ruins of it anyway. It's another reminder of great walls, wasn't it? The Roman Empire, when they came and conquered Britain, <clears throat> listen, let's not, they say they, kinda, they stopped short to keep the picks of Scotland out, you know, these barbarians over that side of the border. And, um, but they did come up and give Scotland a few bloody noses, so let's not think we for anything beyond it. And there's that legendary tale of a, a, a legion that went missing. They made a film out of it as well. Some people say it's fact, some people say it's fiction, you know. So listen, whether it is or whether it isn't. We were a crazy bunch and they thought, oh, we don't need to bother we up there too far. Let's just, let's put a wall here. And it was a means of, of just the demarcation, uh, demarcation line, if I pronounce that properly. And it's just where they stopped and they made it a kind of border. And it meant you then, you said, right, this is, this is what we control, but it's not what we control. Demarcation line. I just sometimes trip over some words, so please excuse me. I don't make any apologies. People just have a little laugh at that as well. So, so praise the Lord. Of course, we have uh, York City is in, in England as well. It's famous for its walls as well. In England, that's another kind of Roman uh, city as well. It's a walled city in our York. Been there, haven't we, Linda? We've ticked that box. And, um, and so that's another example of walls we walled exciting. cities in. Sorry. It was oh, dead exciting. <laughs> Look forward to China. Look forward to China, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we have that. And then, of course, we everybody remembers the Berlin Wall. It's quite famous, wasn't it? Separating East from West communism um, from the rest of the Western world. And they, they built that wall in 1961. That wall was built. And not only was it to keep people out, but it was to keep their citizens in. Because everybody wanted to leave. The communist bloc, we all wanted freedom and to enter West Germany, of course. So they had to build a wall to keep their poor souls trapped and kept them in 
And of course that wall came down in 1989, just a little bit of history there for you as well. The wall was brought down, Germany was reunited, and maybe there's a spiritual, biblical significance to that. We'll wait and see. Um, I'm sure there is some place. And, um, but that was there as well as another example. And of course, we all know Donald Trump's wall that he wanted to put up. Or shall we say fence? If I say wall, we can talk about fence um, that was to keep the Mexicans out or keep all these undesirables out who all wanted to go to the land of America, the land of freedom, the land where you'll make huge amounts of money and wealth. Well, I want to tell you, there's a massive poverty in America as well. And so it was like when we all used to run to London, wasn't it? You know, from Scotland, they wanted to make your name. Let's go to London. And I'll make my name and my fame. And of course, there's a lot of people lying about the streets of London. There's great poverty in all of these places. But again, we can see that as Donald Trump's <clears throat> built that wall and wanted to put it down in his legacy. And of course, we see the Israeli West Bank barrier, also known as the Israeli West Bank wall, that is in place even to this day. Uh, and part of it is a fence, but it's a big wall round about it. It's a separation barrier in the West Bank along the Green Line. The barrier is a contentious element in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel describes it as a wall necessary for security, a barrier against terrorism, which I agree with. And it could have stopped all the suicide bombs and attacks and, um, and enabled their people to live in safety. But of course the Palestinians I call it a racial segregation or apartheid wall. That's what it's known as, and that's what there's massive, you know, disagreements with. But we've all got walls to one extent, haven't we? Because we all live in houses, we've got four walls. And um, and so we've all we're all got walls, we've all got things that, and it brings security, it brings us peace, it, they they protect us. We feel safe in our house, don't we? When you get into your house, it becomes your little palace or your little castle. Some people get bigger castles than others, but we've all got that. It's a place we feel safe and secure because we can go in and we can lock the door and um, we know who's going to come in, we know who's going to go out, or hopefully we will know that was the case. So we're used to <coughs> walls. But I've got down here, but you can always see, but there's always two sides of a wall. There's always two sides of a wall. There's, in many cases, there's freedom on one side and there could be imprisonment in others. We think of prison cell, the prison walls are prison. You know, it depends what side of the wall you're on. We built these walls to contain, to protect us from them and to keep them from harming us. So we're all used to walls that bring that sense of security, doesn't it? And that we can see there. Of course, we met Linda and herself, we did the trip once to Krakow, and we know what the Nazis did as well. They, they, they built the ghettos, they still see the remains of these walls. So you'd a walled city within a city. And that's when they put all the Jews, they called them ghettos, and then they built walls around them to contain them. So life was brilliant in that side, but if you were stuck in a ghetto, it was terrible. <clears throat> and in fact, because we showed a little clip from Schindler's List on Friday night, and, um, and I hadn't seen that film for years. And so I treated myself, don't do telly at all much, but I went home that night after watching that little clip and um, I managed to watch half of it. I'm going to catch the other half. To refresh myself again, <coughs> ignore history at your peril. Yes. And um, so I just got more of a flavour and just revisited that. And, and you see the life in the ghettos was unbelievably terrible. And again, this is what man does, doesn't he? We build these terrible places of walls. Freedom on one side can be imprisonment on the other side. But I'll go down here, there's also invisible walls that we erect to protect ourselves. Yeah. We've all got walls to one extent or another, isn't it? You know, and you can either let people into your life or you can keep people out of your life. And we're all good at that, aren't we? You just meet people, you don't, you know, so there always is a little element of, you know, that we can put walls up and we, we keep people from really getting to know us and, and we're very guarded and many times, and, you know. But, you know, sometimes, as someone once says, um, a closed book or an open book. You know, we can be a closed book or we can be an open book. And I believe God has called us to be open books. Someone once says, never judge a book by its cover. You've heard that expression now. Sometimes you can just look at somebody and immediately in your mind you've made an opinion of someone just on the surface. And that's why they say, well, never judge a book by its cover. And you have to kind of get inside and read the story. But some people just don't like you coming inside their lives and they actually keep you on the outside, you know. I've called that a cover-up. So you can be a, a cover-up. So you never really let people really know 
too much and you covered yourself up, a lot, you disguise yourself, you keep people from knowing you. Well, we see that very much with evil people, masters of the cover-up, aren't they? They always come like charlatans and chameleons, you know, they come and they, they don't want you to really know, so they've got a kind of facade, if you like, of who they might be. It's only once you start spending time with people, then all of a sudden, you know, you start getting a little bit of their character, don't you? And it takes time sometimes, and some people just don't want to let us in. Glory to God. I've got down here, sin will always try and hide itself. Sin will always try and hide itself. Especially in the house of the Lord. We don't want to let people know what's going on in my life or the things that I know myself are wrong. It's a little bit like when Adam and Eve sinned. What's the first thing they did? They hid now all of a sudden the presence of God comes in and Adam and Eve are absent. And the Lord has to say, Adam and Eve, where are thou? And it's, well, we're over here hiding in the fig tree. Because <laughs> we heard you come into the garden and, and, it, and it, you know, and then we know the rest is history. Why are you hiding from the of that tree? So we know when sin comes in, we tend to kind of, we put up a cover and we have a cover up yeah. as a people, even Christians. There is that cover up and we tend to hide, if you like, from the presence of the Lord. But some people, other people are just so be shy and so reserved and, you know, we become like, you know, and, we, and, we, and we, we don't like being in the public domain and we become very private. I'm a very private person. Well, as Christians, we were never called to be private people. God expects us to be open. We're to be open books, not to be closed books. God wants us to be open books. And then that's why we have this open book and we have, we get... God brings us into the life of many of the great heroes of the faith. And as I said often, I'm sure David says, Lord, did you have to write that out there for the whole world to see? And with the Bathsheba and, the, and you know, and the, causing the murder of Uriah? Did you have to put that in the book? And I'm sure Peter must have been says, Lord, did you have to tell them? I mean, could you not just kept the good bits of making out the boat and walking in the water? Did you have to tell everybody that, you know, that I denied you three times? And we can read many stories of, you know, of these wonderful saints in the Lord. And I just love it because we see their humanity. Sometimes we've got them down as like halos and, you know, they live these extraordinary lives. No, they were flesh and blood like us. That's why James says, you know, I mean, Elijah was a man like, Elijah was a man just like us. But a man who prayed in the heavens was shut for three and a half years. Hallelujah, a man who had a relationship with the living God. But there were still men and women like us. Now second Corinthians, as I said, I get down here some people though are so protected of being hurt that they only succeed in hurting themselves. So you've been hurt before. How many times have you ever seen that woman who's been hurt in love and that says she can never trust another man or vice versa you know a man's been hurt with a woman and then after they say oh, I can never put myself through that again ever because you know and now to their own demise you know I now I become a prisoner of heart and I'm kind of shut down and, and, and I need to open up. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you need to open up. In fact, just a, a crazy one actually because it was Christine Begg comes to mind. You know, Christine only had one child as Ian and um, Ian and Ariana. Ian used to be at this church. And you know, so when Christine had her first child, she says, the experience was so terrible. She says, <laughs> she goes, I will never go put myself through that again. So Ian became an only child, you know, because I think they were planning to more of a family, but just one, the, the experience was so hurtful and so terrible. She says, I'm not going through that again. How many times will you women on no more than me, obviously? <laughs> now, us men have to go through a bit as well. I still remember being in the room. <laughs> And this agitated woman, you know, like you know, everything, you know, you're getting to bring a bit of comfort to her, you know, you're trying to kind of, you know, to be a strength and encouragement, you know, and shut up! <laughs> is it so? Is it so? That's a great comfort. Is it so? I don't know what to say. Is it so? Oh, she went off in a duster. <laughs> I was, I was scared, I was terrified, I never said another word, I just, I was just a silent presence there, just thinking about a strength. 
I said, the funny story is I was really annoyed that she snapped at me so much. So I, just, I stood there very quietly and then I just kept marrying the graph and everything. I started to see the peak in his mouth. I was in the room. Praise the Lord. Listen, just to be scripture, a couple of scriptures here, Second Corinthians 6, reading from verse 11. I don't know why I include this this morning. It came kind of late in my, as I was putting the word together, Second Corinthians 6. And we'll just read a couple of verses from verse 11, just to 13, two verses. And here's Paul writing to the Corinthians church now, and you know, there's been there's been people who come in, they've attacked Paul, they've undermined Paul, and there's there a lot of things going on in this church. Thank God that we read these accounts and realize that in the early church there was a lot of things going on in the churches. There's nothing unusual when the church of all hell breaks loose in the church, it's just part and life of church. Amen. We've got an enemy. Who will attack us and will try and cause division. Mm-hmm. Now here Paul writes and says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. We have opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you, my children. Open wide your hearts also. Maybe that's a word for someone. You now sometimes you can get hurt and you can close your heart up. And Paul says, you know, when you, we have opened wide our hearts towards you. Would you open wide your hearts back towards us? It's a fair exchange. Christianity is a a fair exchange. God has called us to be open books. We do open up our hearts. That doesn't mean we wear our hearts on our sleeve. People just gush out all this stuff, you know. But listen, what I'm saying is, though, let's be open. Let's, let's, Let's not be hidden to one another. Let's be willing to share with one another. And I'm not just talking about resources. I mean, it's very easy just to say, well, I'll share some money with somebody or share my food with someone. Share your life with someone. That is scary. Yeah. And we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, I don't mind sharing with this person because I really like them. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Listen, we've all been called to share with one another and we share our hearts with one another and that's when we really will experience the love of God in our midst. How can you say you love God but you can't love your brother and sister who you can see? Don't catch yourself on. Oh, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, but I can't stand these people. And then people say, that's why people leave the church and say, ah, I'm out of here, I'm going to go and find another church. And then they get to this other church and they go, for goodness sake, there's problems here as well. <laughs> yeah, it's called people. <laughs> it's people. Glory to God. So we see here as well then, this other side, the spiritual walls that we can put up. Let's bring them down, guys. Let's let's just, let's just, let's just, let's just open ourselves up to one another. Be vulnerable. You know, we don't like being vulnerable. We like to have that kind of composure to think I'm composed, you know. You know, step up on an old man and all that business. Listen, let's just be, let's just be open, you know. Let's just, don't be scared for people to see your weaknesses. Glory to God. Paul, Paul says, you know, when I'm, the Lord speaks to Paul, when it, he says, Paul, don't, this thorn's good for you. Now, who knows what that thorn was? Because he says, when you're weak, he says, then I'm strong. Why do we always want to be, I'm the strong man? I'm the man, or I'm the woman. <laughs> we always like that, you know, I'm the meal. <laughs> I don't say we get a bit of being weak. Oh, I'm just a worm, and you know, I'm nobody. What I'm saying is, though, don't, don't be scared to be yourself. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. You know, when you're in a house with your family, it's amazing the stupid things you do, especially when they be grandkids, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I must confess, I'm a papa. And you become like this, you know, I'm crawling about, I mean, another day I'm crawling about the grass, getting on as a lion, chasing them up, up the grass, you know, and I don't care what the neighbors saw. <laughs> and I was like, I'm a minister, I'm going to say, I'm a bit composed here, I'm a minister. <laughs> he's barking, he look, he's running like a lion. Can't not even Superman is standing on top of this wee log. <laughs> Glory to God. Let's not be as scared to be just people. Hallelujah. But also there is spiritual walls, and this is where I'm going to finish. So we've got, there's invisible walls that we can put up, that we can dictate to. We, we, we keep ourselves safe within parameter walls. 
And we do ourselves a great injustice to that, brothers and sisters. I want to emphasize that fact because some of this stuff came to me late. Let's just let's let's get let's get rid of our walls. Let's be let's be open. Let's be open. Let's let's not be scared of, you know, the, what they see me and they might not like me. Well sack it. Glory to God. The most the only person I'm really interested in is liking me is the Lord Himself. We went to secondary. <laughs> but it's true, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's Him that I want to impress the most. It's Him that I will have to stand in front of and give an account of my life. It's Him that I'm going to get into and spend eternity with. Of course I want to impress the Lord. Of course I live for the Lord. I want to be open towards Him. He's been open towards me. Hallelujah. He opened his heart to me. And thank God I've been able to open up my heart to him. I have to constantly work on it though. These hearts are terrible things. Sometimes they get hard. Sometimes it's so easy they can get hard. I mean, to keep them soft in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God, he'll keep them soft. And just let that love of the Lord and just melt them. But as I said, we'll get spiritual walls as well. In Job 1, we have the, the, that great account of Job. We did a little bit of that, didn't we, Nigel Debbie there in the Margaret's house? Yeah. The sufferings of Job and the, we did have a little look at that. Trying to kind of come to it. But we'll just read a couple of verses here. <clears throat> Let me break in. Let's break in at six and we'll just do a few verses here. It says, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who shuns, a man who fears God and shuns evil. What a tremendous, you know, tribute there coming from the Lord. Have you observed my servant Job? Hallelujah. And Satan, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, you put a hedge around him. One other verse that says, you put a wall around him. So a hedge wall, right? So you put a hedge around him or a wall around him and his household and everything he has. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Stretch out your hand and strike him and everything he has. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, very well then. Everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And so we can see here, there is an invisible wall that God is protecting Job. God has got a wall around him, and Satan can't touch him. Satan says, oh, does he fear you? I can't get near the man, there's this big wall you put around him. Why, men, was I'm desperate to attack him. I am desperate to, 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 to break into this man's life. I can't get near him because your hand of protection is over him. Glory to God. Do you know there's a protection for us? It's the sense of God. And just because you can through difficulties, don't underestimate the protecting power of the Lord. That's because although he gave him permission, he said, but on the man's life itself, do not touch it. I want to tell you this, our lives are in the hands of God. Amen. When we walk correctly before the Lord, Amen. his hand of protection is upon us. Glory to God. But God gives them permission to test. To test him. He's given them permission to test but we see the shield first. Let me just read a couple of other verses, just in the Psalms, just to see that protective power. And then we're going to come back to the test, because I've got three, um, I've got three things up there. So let's just 18, Psalm 18. This is means a lot to me and Linda. There was a time that both of were seeking the Lord. I was in Psalm 18 and she was in 2 Samuel 22. And actually it's Psam 18. Second Samuel 22 as well. So I think the Lord's speaking to us. <laughs> Just a couple of verses to begin with. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. I come to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I am safe from my enemies. So again, we have that. He is a stronghold. He is my fortress. He is the rock, the one who is looking after me. And we can jump up to Psalm 91. 
a few verses up here. It's Psalm 91. It's a famous psalm, isn't it? Psalm 91. I think everybody loves Psalm 91. And the first couple of verses, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and He is my fortress. In God, in whom I trust, surely you will save me from the foul of snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. So again we see that protective power of God upon those who confess his name. When God comes into your life, and we'll just do one more, and again it's another psalm of the great man David. Read a couple of verses here, we'll break in at five. It says, you hem me in and behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Glory to God. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So we can see again the protective power of the living God. For those who have confessed his name, the Lord is shield is upon us and he protects us in this life. And even though we go through trials and tribulations, thank God his protection power is still there. Hallelujah. Amen. But everything must be tested and we see that even in Job's life. Devotion needs to be tested because you'll never really know if somebody really loves you until you test the love. And so, we, oh, you know, everybody, well, why did God give Satan permission to test Job? I mean, why did he then take down his, his walls of protection and let, let Satan loose to attack him? Well, see, when you get to heaven, you can ask him and I'll ask him at the same time. <laughs> Amen. There's lots of theories in that. There's lots of different reasons behind that. I just say this, everything needs to be tested. Your devotion is one thing to say, oh God, I love you. You're wonderful, you're glorious, and oh Lord, you're everything to me. Yeah. And God says, well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see, we'll test that. Everything is tested. You go to school, you do your, you do your work. You have to do a test at the end of it to see if you learned anything. I remember somebody was giving me an odd lesson and that guitar sits in my office, condemns me every time I look at it. I got it for my 40th. It shows how many years ago that is. <laughs> and it was a case of, he gives you a couple of lessons and says, well, you'll need to practice the next time we meet. And next time you get the guitar, he'll know of you. <laughs> oh yeah, I've done a bit of practicing. No, you haven't. So everything has to be tested. We see that. We see that great test that came to Peter as well later on in his life, didn't he? Lord, I'm prepared to die for you. I will never deny you. Is that, is that right, Peter? He says, he says, Satan, listen to me, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, Peter. Satan has asked for permission to sift you as wheat. And Jesus says, I never looked him to him. It doesn't actually read that, but Jesus says, but listen, when you turn back, he says, strengthen your brother. But he says, but I am praying for you. So Peter had to be detested on that devotion. Oh, I'll never deny you, but we'll see about that. We'll see. Everything in life's about a test. God will test us to approve us. Don't see that as a negative, see that as a positive. I was encouraging some of the, the, the two sisters in their trials and tribulations. I think it was Marion, and it was just like, and I think I put it out there on the notice board there as well. We will be tested in our faith. But when we come through the test, we're stronger for it. And we can prove God in our lives. Hallelujah. And it makes us a stronger person. A stronger person once we've through something. We are stronger for it. Hallelujah. If we pass the test. So there's an element of the spiritual walls. It's, there's a test there involved as well. Let's go to Isaiah. Five. God's protection walls. And we're on that theme there. So we'll go to Isaiah. Chapter 5, we're just going to read a couple of verses here. And we'll read from verse 5 to 7. Not 5 to 6, we'll miss out 7. And of course, this is the Lord's judgment now coming against Israel because of sin now. They've sinned against God, they've rebelled against the order of God, they've went after foreign gods, and they've rebelled against the very order of the living God. Now judgment is coming. Amen? Judgment. So we can see another element of that, and now God is going to take away their walls because of their sin. Now he says, now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. What was Israel? Judah. I will take away its hedge. I'll go down there, I'll go down there, Job. I will take away its hedge. 
and, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled on. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. Amen. Judgment now is coming to Israel. God says, now I'm going to take away your walls, your protection. I'm your God who will protect you. But sin is going to bring God's judgment. This is a message that's not popular in the church. I want to tell you, I want to, I want to tell you right now. It's a message I'm preaching in this church. Amen. God will not tolerate sin. We're living in this new world that we live in in Christianity. And it's as if, well, we're under the age of grace and hyper grace and super grace. As if now, you know, the God of the Old Testament, well, he's, you know, he's quite prepared to swing at sin now. And just put that under the, the carpet. You know, you put the dust under the carpet. <laughs> Sweep it under the carpet. We don't want to upset things. We want to just keep a nice, happy, buzzy place. And let's just preach happy, buzzy things. And Listen, judgment will come to us when we sin. Hallelujah. Yeah. New Testament and also Old Testament. Isaiah 59 and 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Mm -hmm. Your sins has hidden his face from you, so that you will not hear. Sin will always bring judgment of God. Yes, there's grace. God will give you grace to get yourself in order, get things sorted out. But when there comes a place then stubbornly when I then refuse that and I deliberately then carry on in my sins, I want to tell you this, judgment's going to come. The judgment of God will come. To bring correction. To bring correction. So we see that. Hallelujah. We see that. Guys, we need to get things sorted out. I am very passionate to see the glory of God in this church. And when sin comes in, I want to tell you this, it will bring destruction and it will chase God out of this church and God will not hear our prayers. I love the fact on Friday night that we gathered here as a church and we were fasting and praying as a church and we were taking hold of God and we just heard an account of how God moved powerfully. You can say, well, that was just the drugs. And thank God for the hospital staff and doctors. Oh, no, I want you to see the hand of God in this. Hallelujah. And the other areas that we've started to see the hand of God in. Well, a New Testament scripture. And this is a good one for us men. When he's given instructions for husbands and wives and how we relate to one another. He says, hey, love your wives and look after them and take care of them. He says, because if you don't, your prayers will be hindered. Your prayers will be hindered. And that's just not treating your wife nicely. That must be a good job, Linda. <laughs> Do we see how things then can get in the road and all of a sudden things can go wrong? The judgment of God will come when we have not got our lives in order. You know, we talk about, you know, the gospel, salvation, getting someone to receive the Lord. And then we seem to kind of forget about the whole aspect of sanctification. The gospel's only the door in. And then the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and says, right, now, hey, I'm going to do a work in you now. I need to conform you to the image of my son. Now let's get rid of this and get rid of that and get rid of the next thing. Let's, let's do some business here. Hallelujah. I'm going to finish with this scripture. I'm on a roll. I don't really want to finish, I'll be honest. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to exhaust you. I want to preach the gospel. I want a bit of life in this this morning because I really do feel we need to hear it. Hallelujah. I need to hear it. Amen? Because I know the old man in me and I know the things that wage war against me. Mm. Glory to God. And I need to keep myself in that place with the Lord. And that takes work and that takes effort. Mm. And that takes determination. Hallelujah. Amen. Because I'm not looking at this world. I'm looking beyond this world. And I'm looking at the heavenly realms. Because that's where my home is. Mm. Glory to God. It's not in this world. This world was against us. This world is filthy, wicked and evil. Yeah. And some of us better waking up to it. Oh, the world's lovely and we can just run around and we think we can enjoy all these things. This world stinks yeah. and you need to hear that. It stinks to high heaven and the church is in the midst of a stinking filthy world and the church has been enjoying the world for far too long. Hallelujah. And that's why we've lost the power of God and that's why we've lost the voice of the living God. I believe God is restoring the voice of the church and before he can do that we need to clear up a few messes. Hallelujah. And it begins with me. Now, I'm going to finish with this scripture in Proverbs. It means a lot to me. It's underlined here. 
If I don't underline for some time. Proverbs 24, reading from verse 13. Man is up nicely with Isaiah 5 and 5 and 6. And um, you can watch this again even or take note of it. Visit it at home and go over it. It says, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of a man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere and the ground was covered from, with weeds. Thorns and thistles and weeds are all to do with sin. Amen. And listen, and the stone wall was in ruins. The stone wall again was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a bandit mm -hmm. and scarcity like an armed mm -hmm. man. Hallelujah. I'll get down here slothfulness. And this is what's happened to a lot of us. We'll become slothful, lazy, unwilling to work, completely disorientated. I looked up the word slothful and this was dictionary definitions. Listen, guys, we're trusting God for a revival. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you right now, revival begins with you and revival begins with me. It's personal oh. revival. Yes. Personal revival. So when we read there in Proverbs, it says, I went past the field of a man, four walls, that was in his domain. And he says that he's seen something. What The walls down, the thorns and thistles have come up everywhere. Hallelujah. Come up everywhere. And then he applied a lot of sleep a little slumber, a little resting. And that's what happened to the church. We fell asleep on the job. We weren't the watchmen on the walls that we should have been. We, we, we fell asleep, we became complacent. We lost our position and our place. But thank God, you've heard me saying, God is restoring. God is restoring, hallelujah. God is restoring his church. Or for those who are gonna hear this word today and say, do you know something? I need to start doing some business with myself. Make all the excuses under the sun. You make the excuses in light of this book. You make your excuses in light of this book and you read that word with a whole heart and say, Father, what are you saying to me through this word? That's called exegesis. Lord, what is that word saying to me? Not eisegesis, what you'll hear through God TV channels and all these other ones and you'll have men's interpretations. Oh, well, this or that and their opinions. I want to know his opinion by his spirit. What is he saying to me and what I need to do about it? Amen. I need to be changed. I need to do some weeding in my life. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I've been doing a bit of weeding out there in the ground. So it can be hard work. So you have to start turning over the ground again. It's hard work to do that. You have to get a spade in there. And I work on it. And I think people are saying, I'm not too scared to do the grounds in the church. Maybe because there's nobody else probably willing to do them. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. As I say to people out there, what's the point of having a cracking church inside and outside looks like a bag of onions? And just looks like jungle. And besides, you know what I say to myself when I'm doing it? Well, my father's a gardener. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And I get a chance to share and I get a chance to witness when I'm out there that people can buy and I can engage them with the gospel. Glory to God. And then see, once I've finished, I stand back and I look at and I go, wow, it's nice. Put in some nice plants and things, dig out the weeds and trim up the edges and put the grass in order and one thing, and then you look back and go, do you know something? That looks pretty decent. Take it to your own life. I know the person I was. And then you start to tidy your life up. Now, I know the things I'd like cut or my, you know, whatever. And then you start to just allow the Lord to do his, do his work in you. Glory to God. Guys, I want to encourage you. Revival begins with you and it begins with me. Take your eyes off everybody else. I mean, I, I want to see if you could just put as much energy into wanting to get a mask off your face to say, get this into my life. That would be fantastic. Oh, well, I'm real. You know, hey, I'm with you in that. But I want to tell you this, put as much energy of that into there to say, I need to get my life, I need to get, I need to get rid of things in my life. Not just the external, but I need to deal with the internal. Hallelujah. And listen, I bring this word that's going to believe that God put this word in my heart. I remember a long time ago we had a lot of youth in this church. A lot of youth in this church. And there was a case where it came to my attention. Listen, things will always come to my attention. Somewhere down the line. There's a place of grace and people come in, I don't know you all, I don't know your personal lives and one thing or another, it's fine. 
It's your business. But usually things will come to my attention. And I remember then it came to my attention that two of the young people jumped into bed together. I like you use your imagination. And so I was very gracious. I'd organised to take them out, took them over to Asda, we had a little bit of lunch together. And then I brought it to their intention that, listen, this has come to my attention, I says, and I can't ignore it. I was like the police that day when they came in here and busted our service. It says, listen, sir, we've had a phone call and um, we've been called to deal with this situation. You're illegally gathered in here as a church. He says, and we need to deal with it because we've been called to deal with it. And I says to them, and I was very gracious, I said, look, guys, I need to deal with this because the rest of the youth all know about it. I can't sweep this under the carpet. Because if I sweep this under the carpet, then I'll be sweeping loads of other things under the carpet. I says, well, look, and I was very gracious, look, hey, I'm not that old that I don't understand life. I says, but look, we need to deal with that. And, you know, the girl was very repentant. She goes, oh, no, 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 no sorry, it won't happen again. And he stared at me like, <laughs> looks could kill. He never came back. Within a space of maybe three, four weeks, we lost so many of the young people. Because we said, well, that's the standard well. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's the standard well. We, we only need to leave. This is why people shop around different churches. Well, I think I'll go to that church because they don't really say an awful lot about that sin or that sin. And yeah, I, feel, I feel comfortable there. So they do a lot of, kind of shopping and find the right church that just fits. Let me tell you something. There's two pillars in this church and I want to tell you what they are. Holiness and righteousness. And we need to put things right. I want to see a revival in this church. If I just let sin flourish in here and we don't do anything about it and, and, and you're free to do whatever it is you need to do and I'm looking up there when I'm talking about this just in case anybody thinks he's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> then that's your choice. You're free to do that. I'm just telling you what I want to see in here. Sin will drive God from this place if we just let it flourish. We need to deal with it. You need to deal with it. I need to deal with it. I'm not praying myself as a perfect picture. I'm constantly having to check myself. I'm constantly having to stand in the mirror of the word. I'm constantly conscious of this. But we need to get ourselves right with the Lord because we want to see another God in here. I want to be able to bring prayers in here and start to see God moving powerfully. Because when there's an environment when the people of God who are passionately in love with the Lord, who are walking in righteousness, who desire to be holy, no, none of us is perfect. But there must be a desire, though, to get ourselves right with the Lord. I want an atmosphere in here. In fact, Linda told me a story just recently. There's somebody that goes, comes along to raise of hope. And, um, and the, um, I don't know, I'm just getting the clearance of that because it's out there the menu, isn't it? And they said, they come down here, so we have an exercise class for Raise of Hope. They come down here and do a wee bit of exercise. And Raise of Hope is our charity outreach, cancer support group. Does a tremendous work. Called Raise of Hope. We want to see real hope. And lives are getting prayed for. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and Jamie's wife, Yvonne as well. And just in that note, Yvonne had a very good report again back from a phone call there, Jamie. And she thanks everybody for the prayers. My apologies, I should have actually said that. But So Yvonne got a good report. She thought I'm not... Nodule on, on her lung. She's very concerned about it. When you've been through a terrible time of cancer, listen, when things start, anything, pains come again. So they told her, don't worry about it, it's okay. We're not, we're not concerned too much about this nodule at this moment in time. So praise the Lord, it was good. And she was so relieved. And she thanks everybody, by the way, for their prayers. Listen, I want to be a, a church that's, that we want to see God move in the behalf. We don't want to just. When people hear about you, oh, the church is praying for you. Oh, that's nice. A wee prayer, that's lovely. <laughs> oh, you want to say a wee prayer for me? Oh, thanks a lot, that's nice. Oh, that's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> for too long, the world seen that, and for too long, my prayers have been powerless. I no longer want my prayers to be power powerless. I want my prayers to be powerful. Amen. I want to know when we're crying to God, we're doing business with God, that the very heavens are shaking, demonic powers are shaking. Because there's a church that is praying and they're going through. Because there's power in prayer. Yeah. But power in prayer is, comes from a holy and a righteous life. If there's sin in your life, I want to tell you this, your prayers will be ineffective. If it's glaringly knowing sin. I don't even mind I'm spitting on other people. 
Guys, hear my heart today. <laughs> Put things right. Yeah. And you know what's going on in your life. And I'm also, listen, sometimes it takes a bit of time. Sometimes things can't be put right tomorrow. But at least put a roadmap to say, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to, get on top of that and I'm going to, I'm going to deal with that. And I've, I've put it on my map, I put it in my diary and say, right, okay, I'm recognising this, now I need to do something with it. It can't always necessarily be done tomorrow. I say this often to people. Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was built. Hallelujah. Amen. And God is very gracious. Thank God he is gracious. Thank God he is long-suffering. Thank God he knows we're weak and we're vulnerable. Thank God he's tolerant. Thank God he gives us a bit of grace and, you know. But as long as he knows your heart, they say, right, I'm going to, I'm, I need to deal with this. I'm going to get that sorted out. And then sometimes you think, you think you're doing brilliant and all of a sudden, and then he puts his finger on something else. I mean, I thought I was dead. <laughs> I need to deal with this now. And I need to deal with that. Thank God we've got a father who wants to make us like his son. The sinless one. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to finish there. But I'm leaving this place open for prayer now. And do you know something? You just say, sometimes it's nice you just want to come forward and say, do you know something? I just want to... You don't have to come up here and confess your sins to me. I'm not Father O'Malley. I'm Pastor O'Malley. <laughs> but can I tell you this as well? Though? The Bible says the Bible says this. Confess your sins one to another. And there is a point to say, do you know something? You know, that really touched me. I need, I need to deal with some stuff here. And, you know, and can, can you pray for me? Maybe there's a situation in your life and maybe you're struggling to get rid of it. That might need a bit of prayer. I mean, need a bit of deliverance. That might need a bit of being set free. Or it might just need a good dose of discipline. Self-control. Hallelujah. We give too much power to the, to, to the devil. I mean, I smoke like a trooper before I get saved, and somebody says, don't worry about it, you know, I was two years smoking, you'll get over it. And I was very rational, I went, mean, well, I can wait two years to chuck it, or else I can chuck it just now. Mm-hmm. I climbed a wall, see these people that said they were delivered from nicotine, and you know, oh, as if they never smoked. Man, I was screaming three weeks, <laughs> hanging on the chairs, and I was going to my bed early at night, you know, I mean, seven o'clock just to escape the orgies. <laughs> But glory to God, I got a victory. That was not one day. Hey, two days. Hey, three days. Hey, four days. And then I was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And then I was like, hallelujah, I've got the victory. Now that could be other stuff out there, guys. Listen, there's, there's many things. Pride, arrogance, if we can look at them all right, you know. Can I encourage us this now? The days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The Lord is coming back. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, He's coming Lord. back. And I want you to tell you this. Let us get ourselves right for him. So when he comes, you can lift up your head and say, hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And you're not hiding in a cupboard someplace. Hiding behind a fig tree going, could you, could, you, could, you, could you give me a couple of weeks to get sorted? <laughs> no, today, today, make a decision. And say, right, okay, Lord, there's maybe things that's come to your mind right now. So I'm going, to, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to deal with them. I want this place to become a powerhouse of prayer. I want Amen. this place to become a place Amen. Where we are crying out to the living God. I want to tell you this. Glory to God. When we can then start to deal with demonic powers and that they would say to Paul, well, Paul, we know. Well, we know Jesus, obviously. And we know Paul, but who the hell are you? And that's what happens when we're not right with the Lord. Let us get right with the Lord this day. Paul was going to put on a little piece of music. If you're happy and cool, just go through the back, let's have some fellowship. There is a basket there, Linda will remind me. And if you want to put an offering in there as well, that would be wonderful. If you've been touched with this morning and it's just really affected you, maybe you say, I, I, I'm, I'm just wanting a fresh commitment to the Lord. We have oil here all the way from Jerusalem. <coughs> and then um, maybe we'll anoint you and just give you a, might want just, I want a fresh anointing today. And you might make a decision to say, you know, I've been living below the line. I'm going to step up above the line today. And you might just want a fresh anointing upon your life. If that's you, then you can come up here and make this zone here a place of prayer. And the rest of us can go through and enjoy some lovely fellowship as we just bring that to a close. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.